people also have told me, um, the, you know, you have this magic eye, you got this great eye that you can see it. Well, I can tell you, I'm not, I think I brought the good eye and I got the good eye and I think I came from a, a pretty smart engineering father and a pretty practical mom uh, that nurtured what we were doing athletically and taught us to trust our eyes the way that we look. And I know that I've always been able to see where the club goes and what the body does with that. And then, but I can tell you those years at Skylinks of watching it just get hit one after another after another, you know, Trevor, when he was, you know, 13 or 14 or 15 years old, and Trevor and I aren't too far in age, he'd come out there, he's the best player in the city, and I'd sit in this little corner, and he would hit it, and I can remember what Trevor's golf club looked like like it was yesterday. So that eye part of it, you have it, but the better that you train it, the better it's gonna be. This is the neglectful thing that I see that people do in this audience, and I can tell you that we've done for sure, and I'm not being critical at all, but you gotta watch more golf. You gotta watch more golf on TV, you gotta watch more balls hit. You gotta go to a driving range where you're sitting on the driving range and you're going, if I had him, how would I fix him? And how would I fix him? And how would I fix him? And how would I fix him? So when him comes, you're able to just immediately spit out what you're gonna do and then you have to have some basics. I have had zero success with teaching anybody the same. If you watch Paul Guido swing and Luke List play golf, they look like they're playing two different sports. Um, if when we tell this story a, a bit, I'll go through it quickly. Some of you might have heard of it. Mo and Luke are hitting balls on, at our, on our field on the driving range one day, and Luke's on track man with Nick, and Luke's hitting a seven iron 212 yards, you know? And Mo just comes out, and she's like, hi, Luke, how you doing? You know, she's down here, and Luke's up there, and he's like, hey, Mo, how you doing? They love each other. And so they're talking, and this and that, and Mo goes, what, what club's that, Luke? And Luke goes, what, seven iron, you know? And Mo looks at me like this, and Mo goes, Luke, I got uh, 13 clubs in my bag that don't go over 200 yards. And Luke, without missing a beat, he goes, I got 13 clubs in my bag that don't go under 200 yards. If we could play a scramble together, we'd be the best player in the world. So they're two different people and you're teaching two different people and you gotta look at people like that. You gotta look at their anatomy and what they actually look like. So let's go kind of to, uh, to basics. Can I have uh, V and Brett, why don't you come up here? These are two of my longtime students. I think many of you might know Veronica Felibert's played on the Symmetra and the LPJ Tour. We've been coaching her since uh, she went to college at USC. And uh, this is Brett Letter. I've been coaching Brett since he was oh, eight. eight years old. Um, he still acts eight, but he's older than that. And that's what I love about him, because I act seven. So um, let's do uh, this. Um, why don't you take nine iron out, V? Okay, and Brett, why don't you take two clubs? Why don't you take a nine iron and a wedge? And before you get started, real quick, I just want from, from the perspective, like you've been with him for a long time and stuff, what keeps you staying with him? Um, you nervous right now? Yeah. <laughs> this is a lot of pressure. I don't want to make him mad. Yeah. Um, no, he's a good guy and. Uh, it's always something to learn from, and um, kind of I'm sure I'll get into it more. But all over the years, it's, it's like you said, you know, the the process, and and he'll get into it. But like you know, keep getting better and better, and it's not just golf swing. So like one thing he said to me a long time ago, which I, I recently stopped playing. But when I got done with school, he told me, uh, you know, my golf swing needs to get this much better, and I need to get. And, you know, it's, it's stuff like that, you know, which is, is true, you know, so you start thinking about it, like, how am I going to get that much better? And the golf swing is just a small piece of it, so it's always learning. Pretty much the same. Also, how much he doesn't always just, it's focused on the swing, like, how much he, he takes care of, like, how you're feeling, how you're doing, how things are going in your life, because it's not just, like, a swing. you got to feel well healthy wise and emotional wise yeah. um, I also love the way he keeps everything very simple and I like to get very technical so it's a good combo because he's the opposite all right thank you cool can everybody hear us great so preparation setup alignment posture I like the word neutrality and I think that's a good place to start from Almost everybody that we've coached other than John Cook has started from strong and went to more neutral as he became a better player. John was really weak, and you know, when John's won a tournament, he says, I can't play with this motorcycle grip. My hands are like that, and his right hand's still a little bit weak. I know Mike Mitchell's out here, and you work with him too, and you, know, you get his 
you get John's hand so it looks perfect, and he says, well, I can't play like that, and then next week he wins the tournament, he goes, okay, you're right. So, um, I like neutrality, and MV, why don't you set up to it uh, right here, like you're gonna hit one. <coughs> And this is what I want you to, uh, which is really, really key when you get a player. Your eye needs to see eyes of latitude and eyes of longitude. So I'm drawing like a graph in my eyes, which sounds kind of weird because I'm a surfer guy that doesn't sound like I'm gonna talk about this graph, but my mind's all seeing th things like that. And then after I see things like that, I surf, if that makes sense to you. So when she's set up to a Brett, will you stand behind her and will you hold a plus sign of, uh, behind her like that with two clubs? like that, and would you hold it a little bit more up so it looks more like on the cross like that, and then when you move it over towards in the middle of her head, and like right now you're a little bit too much on the R on the pier, so you gotta move over to your right a little bit, that's too far, just a little bit. You can see what I'm doing there and it's that precise. So I can't look at it like that in the way that I'm seeing it like that, and what we're gonna try to educate everybody today is we're trying to train your eyes so you see that the right way. And you gotta watch people hit shots. Like our habit when we watch people hit shots is they hit it and everybody looks up to see where it goes. Player, student, and their mom that's watching. And your job at the start is to watch those lines in order to make sure you start with those lines and you stay in that box until you get those lines the right way. And if they don't set up to it the right way, even at this level of half tour players that they're out of their routine and they're out of the system and they don't set up the right way and unfortunately they can't play from that spot. So, um, Will you just, uh, is she gonna have enough room to swing through without? All right, cool. Will you just hit a few shots there? Another straight one. <laughs> this is gonna be the straightest you've ever hit in a clinic that we've done. Brett, when you hit, if you hit it outside that net, I am on the ground, I promise you. So I'm not talking right now, I'm, I'm you know, might, might, uh, or I'm not uh, in this situation, I might be screwing around, but I'm watching, keep going. Brett, could you put the balls out of there first or a little quicker and she can fire them and we can be expeditious? Good, thank you. So the next thing we're in on the what is the engine or what is the body going in the and you know so you're going to hear this from kevin who's you know duffy later this week but or later tomorrow the, the body's an engine really and so what is the engine doing and for me like at every level i'm looking at the engine and i look at it in three parts if you can go ahead and make your setup to it i look at it from waist to feet i look at it from waist to shoulders i look at the arms and hands i call it you know support system pivot shaping and those are the three things that kind of get disorganized. And when you watch somebody swing and they're in trouble, like the first time you go, well, go ahead and make a golf swing. Copy what V looks like, who looks beautiful when she swings, you know? They go like that, you're like, well, what are you doing like that? And they, they don't have no idea what their body's doing. So your job is to make them feel what their body does right from the get-go. If you don't get that done in lesson one, it's gonna be not a good lesson. And I would be surprised if they came back. And if they did came back, they came back just because they liked whatever you were doing, but they didn't like the way that they got instructed. So. Um, I'm now going to backtrack one thing and then we'll do this again. Can you go back to longitude and latitude li uh, lines uh, behind her, Brett? And V, would you do your uh, uh, setup like we've done before where you start right from the get-go? I, I see this mistake all the time. So when she hangs over on those lines, I'm looking at it like that. I love the club making her spine fall to the ground. I love her building her stance. I love her slight knee flex, which fits her anatomy. I love her head positioning an awful lot. In my experience, especially what's gone out with different types of instruction, and we're never criticizing anybody's method, but a lot of people have played here a lot in golf, and a lot of beginners do that. And it's easier to move them left after you get them behind the ball than to go the other way. I know that for fact, okay? And so one more time, when she goes through the steps, Good, perfect, and then V, let me see your club. And then I watch a bunch of people set up like this. They just kind of cruise into it. And the cruising into it by not breaking up the set steps is 
incomplete. And remember, if you're really teaching the beginner and you want to make them a great player, they got to do it in a perfect procedure. And today I have a homework assignment for you. Google Kobe Bryant shooting a free throw, okay? And then do Kobe Bryant shooting a free throw with the torn Achilles. And he limps over on the, the free throw line and then he does the same bounce, 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 ball up, deep breath, fire. And you watch tour players, they look like that, but the beginning person doesn't look like that the same way when they come up, they're not holding the bag the right way. So that's that. Okay, go ahead and hit some more. I like power source coming from down below to up. Um, she does an amazing job at that. Her effortless transition comes from the fact that she's in perfect shape, she eats perfect, she understands exactly what she's doing with her body in the swing. She makes effortless looking power in the way that she moves. I like that a lot. You're not getting that from Joe Beginner. Joe Beginner is strong in their shoulders, they want to use it. They're strong in their hands, they want to use it. They're strong in their feet, they want to use it. It's nice to have the strengths, but you got to blend it in so they can swing the golf club. I like grace and pace, I like rhythm. I don't think there's anybody that we've coached that you haven't watched them and said, I remember one time being at a, uh, this probably 20 years ago and Kip saying to me and going, hey, all your players look really soft and really casual and really relaxed and they're making a bunch of speed, you know, and keep doing that, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's what we're after. And when you, when you watch them on TV, I, you know, didn't fall asleep till late last night, I was watching the Skins game. It's amazing how effortless Rory, Tiger, Hideki, J-Day look, and you know, you're gonna have their trainer here later and he's gonna talk about that or he's worked with a couple of them. It's amazing how effortlessly they look playing in, and when you watch them in the gym, it's amazing how what beasts they are in the gym now, which changed, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, where's the club going? Go ahead and swing. <coughs> and what are you looking at as far as the club goes? Are you looking at path? Are you looking at plane? Are you looking at club face? Are you looking at release? Remember, release is just freeing of energy. It's not supinating and pronating or protonating, supinating, whatever that means anymore, okay? It's just where the golf club's going and how it goes through the shot. It always cracks me up when they put the slow motion analysis and Peter Costas does it and, you know, the guy's winning the tournament and he goes, well, he does these things really good Well, he's winning, you know? Um, and is that's really supposed to happen with the club? And do you really know what's happening with the club? And can you see it in live motion? For me, I see it in live motion, thank God, okay? If I couldn't see it in live motion, I would need more video, I would need more track man, I would need more tools, and they're all out there, more than ever before. Best tool you have is your iPhone, but there's a lot of great tools out there. Um, go ahead and take your setup to it. Great golf swings look like they're on plane because they fit the body anatomy. So she swings perfectly on her five foot seven frame up and down and is the perfect blend between on plane, going where it's supposed to, loaded the right way, okay? Um, here's my favorite one. Your hands are angels. Your hands are devils. Your beginning students, steward, uh, students' hands, the devil's in there till you get it out of there. And if you don't get the devil out of there, then you're on the driving range and you see somebody and we all laugh at people's swings, you know? Oh, look at that guy, he looks like he's got a, the wrong side of a, a sparkler in his hand when he takes it up like that. We had these two members at Virginia, <coughs> this one guy, he had a backswing that looked like this. And we had, we had this other member at Virginia, he, he's left-handed and he looked like this. And one time John Merrick was sending the balls in the middle of him, and Mike Miles, who's really funny, he goes, look, Mr. Lessel and Mr. Gooding had a baby, and it's John Gooding, I mean, it's John Merrick. And right in the middle, John's on perfect playing, going whoosh, like that, and these two guys are going like that. Well, the hands mean the devils lived in those two guys, and they love golf. Uh, Mr. Lessel's not here anymore, but he loved golf almost more than anybody I know, and, and Mr. Gooding loves golf, and so does John. Your job is to make sure that the hands become angels and they work. What are good things for learning to use your hands? Like when I, when I was young, I wanted to play in the NFL. I didn't get big enough to play in the NFL, but there was a drill with a football where you kind of catch the football like that. You see quarterbacks doing like that. I learned to play beach volleyball, and once I learned to set a volleyball, it helped my golf. Um, 
once I realized that the golf club really weighed 13 ounces and I didn't have to influence it, the more that you can train your student that, you're, the better you can do that. We don't think outside the box, in my opinion, enough to train your students like that. Because I'm old, I've had a lot of experience at going, wow, I'm not getting to their hands, so now I've got to figure a way in order to make sure their hands get the right look. Uh, you can go to the next one, Alexis. Um, does that one go in, in, in video? Uh, watch this in video right here. I think that explains it. What I'm doing there, probably as simple as you can. That's probably as orthodox as you can. So if I could see your golf club for a second, or I'll hop back up here on the stage. Would you just keep running that one, please, if you would? <coughs> I feel like if you run it, I'm getting more practice since I don't get to hit very many golf balls. <clears throat> can you pause it? Can you start it over again and pause it? There you go. Pause it just at nine. Uh, let's do it up here. That's nine o'clock for me. What's happened in this position? I'm relative to the plane line. I've driven the golf club right back. I have it in the right muscle group. It's loaded in a linear position, so I can turn it up in my pivot from there. That's probably as orthodox as you can do that. Now, if you looked at Payne Stewart, the club was dragged a little bit. If you looked at Dustin's, it's really dragged. If you looked at Raymond, the club was flipped up behind him. If you looked at Reno, it went to the outside. You look at Fred, like in that spot, the club gets opened up and picked to that spot. So you have to vary off of that, but if you were just going to start Joe Jr., and a lot of you said you taught to jun teach Jr., I think you'd have a lot of success just from that spot, okay? I want to uh, put this out to questions just about that spot. I call it the move away. I don't like the word take away. Take away feels snatched to me. Move away feels like I have to do it in the right muscle group. Questions about that spot? No questions? Good. We'll go to the next spot, okay? Will you run it again in video? This is an interesting one. I think Bill asked me this at something that we did in Florida. Does the arms go up or does the body go up? I forget your question, but I remember it's similar to that. Do the arms go up or does the body go up? For me, with tour players, I like the fact when the pivot is transporting the golf club, and that's what I'm seeing more with almost everybody. You know, Even guys that got some funk in there, like Scott Piercy, he's got some funk in his swing, but he can play really, really good. Craig, you out here? Yeah, I, you know, Craig Barlow played a bunch with Scott, m one of my tour players that I've taught for a long, long time. Like, you watch Piercy, it doesn't look right until it looks right, right? So, yeah, so, so he's got some funk in there, but when you watch that funk in there, then also at the right point, it gets right. I've had this argument with so many teachers, is it a backswing game or is it a downswing game, you know? Yeah, they all look great at impact, but you gotta get it loaded up the right way. I haven't changed that belief for me. I think it's the way that you set up to it and the way that you load it. I am not coaching anybody that has made a living playing from golf where we've worried about an impact position. We've set the impact position up before we got there. So if you could just run that one over and over again, Alexis, notice when I get to the top of the backswing, notice my club's right with me. Can you just run it on video? And there's something about that drill when you get it to that spot, because remember, especially with beginner, the golf swing becomes confusing once you get the club away. But in that spot right there, like I'm just turning and letting it go up. And then I can tell you from downswing for me, and this is what I'm watching, this would be the most orthodox, and this is, do you teach a beginner like a pro or a pro like a beginner? If you got me to the top of the swing and I fell out of bed drunk, which has happened before, um, what, nobody drinks out here? Okay. Anyway, so if the club's up at the top of the swing like that and you allow my body to go the other side, my body would unwind from downstairs to the other side like such. And that's all I'm doing is unwinding, and the club is a non-entity. I want you to put that in your memory bank. The club is a non-entity. The less you can think about the club, like Craig, I worked with him for a decade on tour. I never talked about his golf club or his golf ball. We never talked about it, you know? We talked about what he needed to do with his body to make the golf club work, and everybody that's ever paid their mortgage that we work with, that's the same thing, and I can tell you that. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. 
the island. Brett, let's have you do this. People always ask me, what would be the best way to learn to play if you were going to learn to play? Okay? Uh, D, would you feed Brett balls? Brett, start like in that last clinic we did, you did like 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, and 11 o'clock. You did it pretty, pretty big. Do it really small. And imagine that you put your student while he's doing this. You can just start going, Brett. Yeah, no, even smaller, like about like right here, okay? I want to make sure you hit it in the net. So when you fall out of bed drunk tonight, you won't laugh at yourself. So if you put somebody on an island and you gave them that many golf balls, which is like being with Mike down at the hideaway and he's got all those balls down there and you just hit them as much as you want, if they could do that every single day and once they got that starting going so it felt like they made solid contact and they allowed the golf ball to get hit the right way, then you let them go a little bit farther. And every day they start over again like that. And when you watch Patrick Cantlay walk on the golf course, you know, and he's going to start his practice. That's basically what's going on. And if that doesn't start the right way, if we don't get him in that spot, he doesn't do anything more. And at this point right now, it's pretty dialed in. It's pretty greasy, and he's playing great. So we don't have to worry about that too long. But I can tell you when he was 9, 10, 11, 12, 16, 17, 21, 23, 24 with a bad back, and now... That's what we do every single day. So now you can start going farther. Good. <clears throat> and same thing with V. You can see kind of the orthodox look in there. They look different in the way that they look, but they look kind of similar, huh? That club fits Brett's body, and he's just making it go a little bit farther. Okay, Brett, thanks. Let's give V and Brett a hand so far. They're doing great. Uh, let's go to the next one. <clears throat> Here we go, everybody. Um, you guys can sit down for, for, for right now. Thank you. you so Jamie's. Jump off, I jumped off that thing. <laughs> <laughs> so Brett. Oh, hold, yeah. hold, hold one second. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Go. No, I'm just going to no, go ahead, make a comment. I'm, like, so, so Brett does, does, does swing. He doesn't just stand, assist you, and put the cross up. How do you get that cross? Do you have to get an assistant? You got to see it. You got to see it. I mean. Whether you think of this tonight, and I think if you go to the one of these and they're done the right way, and we've got to do these for a long time, we're, we picked every word carefully because we have. So there's a thread through the needle to learn how to teach golf with what just we said, and we want to do it pretty simply, and we're on, you know, that's a 20-minute explanation that kind of covers just about everything that you need to do, but nobody's going to, like, you need on your, to start out if you want to put them in your lab and you want to put a lines behind them, but you've got to start doing that stuff, and you've got to start seeing that stuff without that stuff because we're gonna end up there how, kind of we, how we do that. So I want you to watch these swings going to impact because I know there were some of you who said, oh, that's bullshit, Jamie, I'm an impact teacher, you know, I've got a bunch of stuff out of that. Not that we don't like impact, but there is a secret sauce in, in these swings and it happens right at the ball and this is what we're gonna do because we're gonna be together for the next two days. I'm not gonna tell you what the secret sauce is. And I don't tell anybody what the secret sauce is. But I will tell you that your arm and the club are building a configuration. And you can take all the greats and you can look at them right after they hit it. And that secret sauce is happening in every one of their swings. I've never seen anybody play great that hasn't played out of the secret sauce. And, you know, we get asked all the time, like, I have Josh Gregory here, so I'm pleased to have her. You know, we're, in a lot of ways, we're competing against each other. He's coaching guys on tours. He's, you know, we've coached each other's guys before, so I like Josh a lot. I'm, I'm really happy to have him here, but I'm not telling him my secret sauce. With that being said, I'm telling him everything else that I can tell him because I think that he can kind of see what's going on. So I want you to do this. Stop right there. Pause it. Don't move. <clears throat> there it is. Hossie and the golf club, I think they have that picture up there. Um, he's 15, blown out of the way at the bottom, using his lower body unbelievably. Right hands in perfect inflection there. In the shot, heads in the shot, you know. Arguably, it's, whether it's Nicholas or Tiger, you can do whatever you want, but that's the best player of modern air right there. <coughs> I got to, I would argue, maybe there's somebody here that's seen him as long, maybe Tom, but I got to watch him the first time when he was four. Um, 
and I don't know if anybody's seen him for that long, and I've watched it all. John Cook was his best friend. I've sat like this next to him and watched him. I've had some pretty exclusive stuff. He's a huge Patrick fan, so we spent a bunch of time with him. We played a bunch with him. You did that really good. You, you read, as I said, Patrick, you put him up on the stage. So that's the secret sauce. You figure it out. I'll look forward to your guess. Let's go to the next step. Thank you very much. Hopefully that was helpful. You can clap if you want or not. What is the wheel concept you speak about? <clears throat> yeah, everybody that we work with is in the wheel. This is pretty simple. We're going to go into it two ways, okay? Your job is to keep their spokes straight and to know what they are. And if you don't know what they are, you've got to get them to do a cleanse. And the cleanse would require writing everything that they ever think about on a piece of paper, then going through with a black marker and deciding what they won't, don't, don't, uh, that they don't need. And you're going to end up with 5, 10, 20 things in that. And everybody that we work with has their own wheel. Some of them, it's documented just like that, and they've seen it. I think that's, I think that's V, is that yours? Yeah, that's V's wheel. wheel. And my job is to keep her spoke straight. And that makes my job a lot easier and a lot more defined because all I have to do in that situation is think about what's off and I don't have to go to any other things. I have had zero success once I've diagnosed what the player was going to do and what they were going to be at changing up what we're going to be in order to get them to go. And you have to decide that. And the younger they are, the better they are. How about tour coaches tell me all the time, hey, Josh, tell me this time, everybody whispering in my ear, wow, your guy's doing exactly what you want him to do, you know? Well, they've been doing exactly what we want them to do for a long, long, long time. And it's not only in the way that they're hitting their balls, it's the way that they chip, it's the way that they putt, it's the way they play a practice round, it's the way that they eat, it's the way that they travel, it's the way that they deal with their family, it's the way that they deal. Not that we're trying to make perfect people because they're all totally different, but our job is to know what they are and then that's the wheel. Your teaching has been described as a Michelangelo method. What do you mean by that? Yeah, Michelangelo, that would be another thing that you can Google. Study that, okay? He just got rid of the granite and the art came out. That's the deal. And if you're adding, for me, I'll say, you know, to V, menos is mas. Um, if you're adding and it's not less is more, you're really subtracting from where they're going to be and you're taking stuff away. And, I, you know, somebody told me that great players are like an old great French wine, whatever that meant. They got better with age because they got a little softer and a little cleaner and a little bit more, you know, where everything was doing just what you wanted it to do a little bit. So I have not had a zero, I have not, had not had any success with adding stuff to my player in their deal. And sometimes that Michelangelo stuff is outside the box. Like I can remember Craig uh, at Riviera had a really nice Riviera and we were staying down at that uh, round hotel in LA at the Lux. It was taking us literally an hour to drive home every night, remember? And he played really, really nice. I think he played his way into the last group. And it was like a windy offshore Riviera. And we love Riviera, you know. Um, and uh, Craig, like on Sundays, he was just trying a little too hard. And we had talked about it, you know. Just you're trying and you're doing a little much. And earlier that year, he had played Cypress Point and he had shot 62 um, with uh, playing with the pro maybe, and when he got done, he missed maybe a putt for a 61 in the last hole, is that right? <laughs> you still haven't let it go, have you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, me either, okay. Um, anyway, so, and the guy, when he's walking off the green, I think the comment was, he said to him, Craig, I'll give you the good news and the bad news. The good news is you just tied the corpse record. The bad news, if you would have broke it, Ben Hogan was one of the guys. So Craig, we all thought that was pretty cool. So we get in the, the, we're driving to the last day, and we get in the car, and uh, there was a picture of Cypress Point on the 16th hall on the, on the magazine. And as I was walking out of the room, I was like, I want to make Craig not try too hard, but I don't want to say something to make him not try too hard today. So as I walked out, I just showed him the picture, and then we smiled. We talked about Cypress the whole day. And then he went out, played lively, finished third, made a big putt on the last hall, I remember. And I remember, you know, that night we were eating um, taquitos in, uh, at Craig's favorite spot in downtown L.A., and he said, the magazine cover was really cool. That's Michelangelo. All right. You teach golf in what you call the golf angle, which is different than most. What is the golf angle? Um, v, why don't you just hop down here and, or I, I hop down, you're going to hop up. Um, why don't you hit one at that light right there, okay? 
and move back a little closer to Brett and go ahead and hang down there. And, you know, that, that would be every ball that you've ever seen me almost watch on tour, right, Josh? Like, I'm standing in this spot, and I'm watching the player, and I'm not turning around to see where the ball goes. And at this point, if you have to turn around to see where the ball goes, or you have to run to TrackMan to see what it says, uh, you're in trouble at the highest level. And you got to be able to feel, and for me, that's the way that I can feel like, just make some swings back and forth. Um, I can see everything that she does in that situation. And not only that, I can hear it. That's good, V, thanks. That, not only that, I can hear it. I can hear the compression of it. And um, I don't see very many people do that. It's not a great spot. My girl, Char, <laughs> she tries that at Virginia one time. Don't do it with anybody that doesn't play for a living. <laughs> and, and catches one in the... Yeah, <laughs> right on the side. She goes, well, I'm not going to try that for a while. I said, we're not going to try that until we got a tour player standing in front of you. So that's that. But I, I think that will help you a bunch. And when you remember, you know, I'm, we'll talk about this in a minute, but I'm watching golf. That's what I do for a living. So a tour, you're not be able to run up behind there and go, hey, can you move out of the way, get the caddies out of the way so I can watch my players swing, make sure they're on plane. And if you're doing that too, you're not, you're not doing justice. Go ahead, Rand. What is your favorite thing about TrackMan? Uh, normalized yardage. I think it's a, it's, it's a blessing in that, and I want to hear it in my ear. And, you know, we had this morning uh, with uh, one of our other pros, Little Nick, Luke and I and him at the back of the range, and I'm teaching from the golf angle, and it's foggy, and Luke can't see his ball go, and Luke is hitting it, and as soon as he hits it, Luke and I are calling out yardages, which never were more than two yards apart, and never more than two yards apart from the machine. Now you're cooking with gas. Now you got something. Because he knows exactly how far his ball is flying, which is the big key in the game, and I know exactly what he's doing in order to make the ball fly like that. And I, like, DJ probably, you know, he, does, he doesn't get a lot of credit for this, but apparently with DJ, they went out with his wedges and he found out that he had a wedge shot that he could hit 103 yards, but he couldn't hit any of his other, he couldn't hit any other of his wedges like that. And then he just did that over and over and over again. Then he realized that with a three-quarter swing at 93 and a half swing at 83. And that's kind of our wedge system for most of our players. If you saw the Como Expo uh, show and you watch that little kid Clay, that's basically he's doing. I love the word texture there. And that's what TrackMan and me, are. we're having a synergy for our texture there with normalized TrackMan, or normalized carry distance. Questions about that? I know everybody loves TrackMan, as do I. What do you got? I like normalized all the time because I, that's, that, that's helpful for us, especially for me when uh, Patrick's in Florida and I'm coming out to a tournament and, you know, and, and Patrick will spin if the, his guy, his manager doesn't have the thing on, uh, track, on TrackMan. I'm going to give you a laughing one. I don't know how to turn TrackMan on or off. I can't fold it up. Sometimes because the caddy's got a lot of stuff, I just walk with it on tour. I feel cool, cool walking with my TrackMan. Um, the numbers, I already know what the numbers are. I don't need to see what the numbers are. This sounds, you know, I won't even see the presumptuous line again as a disclaimer. It sounds cocky, but I am track man. That's what my job is, you know. My, my job is to see where the club goes, what the face does, what the angle does. I am track man. So the fact that they found something that can tell me how far the ball got hit, that was something that I couldn't do, although I kind of knew, all right. It just confirms it. What is your overall view of putting? Um, you better do it pretty good. Uh, green reading's probably the thing that I see that's missed the most. Um, it's the thing that we probably work out on on tour the most. Um, I wish I had all the knowledge that I had when I first started with Craig because I think Craig's got one of the best strokes that I've ever seen, but I don't think we did as good a job as we could have done in green reading and seeing the way the ball was rolled. And this is pretty much our mathematical equation. Big picture topography, like obviously if you're playing out here in these valleys, there's some big picture topography. Sometimes you have to look for the big picture, but lands, you know, unless you're in Nebraska. One time the boys were playing in the uh, web.com tour in, um, in Omaha, and, and Merrick, who's a smart ass, said to me, you know, well, where's the big picture topography going? I said, well, where are you? He said, I'm in Omaha. And I said, well, everything on the front nine breaks towards the Pacific, and everything on the back nine breaks towards the Atlantic. So. Um, I like this equation. 
get the land first, okay? Then think about what the green's doing as far as speed. You know, a lot of times we go to a tournament on Monday, the greens are 10, and on Friday morning, they're 13. So get the feeling of the green, and then fa factor in the weather, and then the green complex, and get your read. And then, uh, Brett, why don't you hop up here with your putter real quick, and I think this will be helpful to you. Can you uh, put the, there we go. John Cook used to call and tell me, like he can, Cook, he can stripe it. Like he can get hitting it so good, right, Mike? I mean, he can get hitting it, like it, it looks almost different. It looks like a pull cut that draws and it just shakes and it's soft. And he can hit, do it with his three iron, he can do it with the wood, he can do it with his driver, he can do it with everything. And he was famous for, man, I played really good, but you know, I, I missed some putts. And I said, well, what was the putt like? And he would not explain big picture topography and he would not explain anything. And he would say, well, I missed it on the left edge. And then I started to realize and listen a little careful to all my players and like they were telling me the same thing, I missed it on the left edge or I missed the two well balls outside the left edge. And then you get a caddy and he said, you know, it's here or this or that. And then I started to think about the hole. So this was what we came up with is the left side of the hole is four, the right side of the hole is five. A whole cup outside the right edge is six. The whole thing is three. I love caddying for my players. I think it's one of the best things that you can do at every level. Caddied a bunch for V. I've caddied a bunch for Brett. We're in system when we do it. I never thought that I was going to like it, but I think it's the best way for you to get a look. And we've had some amazing times with the number system. Uh, Long Beach Open a couple years ago, Brett's got a putt maybe to finish third or fourth on the last one. It's kind of a squiggly little putt at El Rado going down there. And I'm looking at the putt, and it's right in between 4.7 and 4.9. And Brett's looking at it, and what, the way that we do it is, if this bottle was the hole, and Brett's putting to there, uh, would you get in your like read stance and I'll get in my read stance? Like I've already looked at the topography and everything and so is Brett and then I would just end up here and then I'm not saying anything. And Brett would, I said, you know, so we're on that putt and Brett says, you know, what, you know, he gives me the number, he says it's a 4.8. And I said, I think it's a 4.875. And Brett's like, okay, I got it. And then we walked away, you know, and the guy that we were playing with, he goes, oh, you're just effing with us now. We don't even know what these numbers mean. You know, boom, he poured it in there. It should be that specific. And this has really been helpful. And this is, there's, you know, I, we invented it. There's no propriety on there. You won't see it on my Instagram page. <laughs> no social media. Um, anyways, you won't see it any place, but I would use that if you haven't taken a picture of it. I think it would be really helpful. Questions about that? Fire. 100%. Mark Price, greatest free throw ever in the NBA. He liked a little pin that was sitting in the hoop, and he was trying to land it on the pin. So, Nicholas said what? Yeah, but, but I think you've got to do that all the time, and this just makes it more detailed. Yeah, yeah, those are, those are good feed, feedback. I, I'd like to look at it this way, like I'm a, I've been to this place, I'll drive there before, but then I get lost. So this is just MapQuest. That's all it is. It's MapQuest for you when you're putting. Thanks, Brett. Uh, what do you got next on, uh, we, yeah, point drill. Um, I actually did this 30 years ago and stopped, and I don't know why, but I think it's the best thing you can do with players. <coughs> 12 to 15 feet or inches past the hole. The hole. 12 feet. Your ball. Apex line with a ball marker where it's breaking off the apex line. <clears throat> Three balls. Low of the apex line, double bogey. Short, double bogey. High of the apex line, but not past your 
15 inches, 12 inches, whatever you love to have that cleanup putt, minus one. Make minus two. All right, questions? One more time, 12 feet, apex line, low, double bogey, short, double bogey, past, too far, double bogey, make, minus two. I've had, I watched Patrick do this, it takes him six balls and I've seen him do it, you know, less than that. I've watched other people do it, it takes them a long time in order to do it. On what you said, enhancing what you're seeing, this is probably the best rewards drill. It's a phenomenal drill for juniors in order to do. And by the way, I see people just putt. They just putt, that's all that they do. Next slide, please. Speaking about Patrick Cantley, <laughs> let's talk about him and, and his growth uh, and development to where he is at today. Yeah, I think as you read the accolades and you can go to that and then you can go into the pro stuff now. I like the 60 at that. You can stop right there. And you can just pause right there, please. Read, that was a pretty good nine o'clock. Um, nice work, Alexis. Read the last thing in bold. It's crazy, right? Crazy, right? It means he's doing everything. So does the process dictate the bottom line or the bottom line dictate the process? Or do you get on a roll or do you build this complete player and then they go out and play and because they're a complete player, they have great success. And you know, about Patrick, <clears throat> and he won't mind me saying this, he's a weirdo in a good way. You know, His nickname is Sheldon on the Big Bang Theory. Um, He's very, very bright. He's got an amazing sense of humor. He's got a take on everything in the world but doesn't give it out. He's got a really tiny little inner circle. Um, he loves the stage. He loves to play. He loves to compete. He's uh, in the pool 24-7, meaning he's doing what he needs to do to be the best. And we're not talking about the best in the world, just to be the best Patrick he can be all the time. He's a model student. He's argumentative when necessary. We had an argument about four or five years ago at this place that we like to have a beer, and it's really the last argument we've ever had that doesn't involve his career, because Patrick likes to argue just to argue. He'll argue white if you like black and vice versa. So, and his arguments are always poignant on this. They've made me better. Um, everybody that we've ever coached says that they want to be the best. He wants to be the best. I can tell you that. And whatever the X factor is or whatever that is, he's got it in spades. And uh, when he gets going, it looks like a freight train. This year at Augusta, you know, he didn't have it through Augusta like till Friday afternoon in our warm down. And then we had like one little thought about his stroke, one little thought about his life, one little thought about his swing. We hit maybe eight balls, hit 10 putts, and then he shot 64, 68. And, Pretty fun to see him in that arena um, have a chance to win the biggest tournament in the world. And we learned from that too, and he's great at learning. He's finished second um, twice in the last two years, shooting 20 under, 23 under, and 22 under at Medina. And then uh, his wins. And uh, there's more to come. And it's, uh, I feel like it's a dream thing. He's in the, I got another generation of players that are coming along, the ones that you saw on the Como show, but this is my third generation of player and the, and the youngest one in it. And he is pushing everybody in our stable. Um, he's pushing V, he's pushing Brad, he's pushing everybody that works with us. He made, I, I arguably would say that he had as much to do with John Cook's 10 victories on the Champions Tour that we shared uh, as I did. Because he inspired John to play more and John inspired Pat to be more of a pro. So that's that. Describe macro versus micro. We are micro golf pros. I don't like the word hate, but I hate micro. It's like what we do all day long. Well, I'll try this, I'll try this, I'll try that. Tuesday morning, you go to a tour event, you're waiting for your player to come out. The, I call it the candy store. They got the putters all around the green. Player comes out, grabs a new putter. Uh, why don't you give me one of those two? New head cover, this and that. Top 10 players come in the world and they go do their gig, they go do their system. They're doing the macro part of it. 
we coach macro. You coach macro when it's a beginner. I'm living proof right now standing here as we speak that if you coach macro the whole time, they can end up being great. If you coach micro, I think we do it too much, and our game teases us with that. Infomercials, podcasts, um, you know, just filling time, Golf Digest. Remember years ago, one of the marquee teachers who since passed was on Golf Digest, and it was a, like lower body quiet, you know, for more effectiveness. 18 months later, same magazine, you know, use your lower body as much as you can for, to be a more complete player. So is that micro or macro? And are you supposed to use more lower body or less lower body? And think of that's us, and we're the most knowledgeable people, people in the world. Congratulations on that. You all work really hard at what you're doing. You wouldn't be here if you didn't. But because of that, you are, um, we get a little bit too much micro. That's probably about four or five of the gems that I gave you today. But ask yourself in your next encounter, are you doing it macro or are you doing it micro? Randy, you're doing great, by the way. Killing it. This is, this is easy. A nice read, the, read the paper. What is the most important thing about coaching, watching golf at the highest level? Watching golf. How many days a week do I watch golf at Virginia Country Club? Yeah, every day. Watch golf every day. This is just a, to see how many of you are watching golf on the golf course? Raise your hand. Every day? I knew you were going to do that, Josh. Josh, don't get me started on you, okay? All right? Um, that's not very many. We've got 300 people here. You've got you know, three or four hands that are up there. Are we coaching them to play golf or are we coaching them to swing? Well, I don't have time to go out there on the golf course. All right? Would you say that really loud? No, not really. I, I'm building them in their own identity, we would say. But I, if you come to Virginia on a Saturday afternoon at 1 o'clock, um, there's one, two, three groups of players. And if all our tour players in town, they might all be playing together. And I've been watching them play golf. I get in my cart. I go out there and watch them play golf. And then I go make sure Mrs. Havocamp's Cobb salad is good. And then I go back and watch them play golf. And then, you know, they're finishing on the 18th hole, and it's right by my office. And the 9th hole is there, and I'm watching them all the time. And I'm on the road 30 weeks out of the year. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's just for a couple, three days. And I'm not there to fix their swing on the driving range. I'm there to watch them play golf. And in a major tournament, I'm at the majors. A lot of times we'll, you know, bring members there. And we'll make it part of our gig. We'll bring our, our coworkers there. And, you know, Nick has stayed with me. And Char stayed with me in order to, to go watch. And, uh, you know, we're, at, we're watching golf. That's what we're doing. And to me, i got to tell you something kind of, I haven't never admitted this before. I like when Luke gets 7.30 and Patrick gets 2 o'clock. And I know I'm going to be there at 5.30 watching the physio work and the warm-up. And I know that I'm going to watch them play the all 18 holes. And then they're going to be done and we're going to kick them out and tell them to go back to the hotel and put their feet up or do whatever they do to stay in their wheel. And then I'm going to get to uh, see Patrick and I'm going to get to watch him play. And I like when it starts to get dark and my feet start to hurt a little bit because I've been walking all day long, you know? So I love that. Watch golf. That's what we do. In three decades, in your opinion, what is the main difference in tour golf? Uh, can you put the slide up? I don't need to say anything to this one. <laughs> I played in the Sierra Nevada Open with Don Bees and Craig Stabler in like 1983. And uh, on the 16th hole, uh, Stabler said, let's play in for a scotch. I had not had a scotch before, and that was my last one. It's not very good, but they were playing for a scotch. You know, now if you're on the 16th hole, it would be Jordan Thomas and Patrick Cantlay and Jordan Spieth, and they would be playing for X amount of dollars, which is enough to keep them dealing, and they're not playing for that. Uh, they might play for dinner, of which they have salmon and a kale, sa kale salad, and they've already worked out twice that day, and they've been, had their body rubbed twice that day, and it starts early in the morning and goes to late at night. So it's just everybody's more all in, inspired by Tiger, inspired by Kobe, inspired by us. Congratulations on that. That's what we're doing. Got a lot of fit, smart people in this room that get that. So 
nice work, everybody. Were you talking about me? Yes. Yeah. I said fit. It's amazing how all these random questions match the, the, the video perfectly. <laughs> You've had the opportunity to work that with... That was pretty funny. I mean, for you, that was pretty funny. Yeah. <laughs> I worked on that all night. Remember, we've only, we didn't have long to prepare for this, so I'm, that was good. This was done in a very short time. Yeah. You've had the opportunity to work with thousands of players who had the ability to play at the highest level. And you have been responsible for 15 people that you have known since junior golf that have made it on the PGA and LPGA Tour. What separates them? The wheel. It's like super simple. It's just the wheel. You got to do it. And I'd like to stop there and uh, ask a question or two about the wheel to you. Like, what are you thinking about there? Like, what are you thinking? Anybody doing anything like that? Can you raise your hand? That's cool. You're doing it because we told you to do it. Questions about that? That cleansing of the wheel, it's the youngest person in here. We got anybody that's 22? That was good too, yeah. Oliver's young. You, we'll coach you on the wheel, Oliver. I promise you that. Got any 80-year-olds in here? Randy? Mom. Andy, you'll do it, too. It's the cool thing about you is you'll do it. So I like the little, and I, I like the little legal pad, and you just start jo jotting things on the legal pad that are driving you crazy, and you're just cleansing your, your mind on that and come up with what you think, and it needs to be in every area. I would argue that I've seen John Cook play his best golf when his family life was the best, and he's an unbelievable husband and an unbelievable father. But when it was the best is when I've seen him play the best, so that's a really big spoke. I'd say John and I, in those 10 Champions Tour victories, we talk less about the club and the ball than Craig and I did in those 10 years. Like, but a lot of them about, hey, come on, let's get ready to play because he's John friggin' Cook, you know? But wind him up and let him go out there. So I would incorporate this. What is poise? Coaching, controlling body function plus controlling comfort plus 100% belief in what you're doing, 100% toughness plus process plus an emphasize, emphasize on Winning in your own gig equals poise. That's that. And when you watch somebody like I'm, you're all smart enough that you could, you could be sitting there watching golf on Sunday afternoon and you could turn the sound down so you didn't have to listen to Faldo if you didn't want to. And um, the, you could look at the players and you could not look at the leaderboard and you can look at our definition and they're doing that, that's the guy that's winning. I almost can do it every week. Occasionally you're surprised. That kid, Lonto Griffin, a couple weeks ago, he just had that look, you know? Josh's kid this year at the desert, Patrick played right in front of him, Adam Long when he won, you know? He had that look from the get-go. He didn't look like he was playing with Phil. He looked like he was playing with that last paragraph. And like, how many times, like in the Tiger air, like I, when the Tiger air at that time, I was still playing a little golf, so I would go someplace on a Sunday and like play golf and then walk in, say hi to the pro, and then go play nine holes. And you know, Tiger would have a one shot lead, and then I come in, and the pro, I would say, How'd it go? And I'd say, Oh, Tiger won by three. And I say, What happened? And he goes, Oh, he looked really poised, and he had a 20 footer he made on 16, and nobody really did anything, and you know, that's how he won 80 times. So that's what they look like, and they look like that in every sport. What was the guy from the Astros? How do you pronounce his name, V? All, the little guy from the Astros, Houston, baseball. What? Say it so everybody can hear it. Sounds way better when she says it, right? Yeah. Um, that guy looked poised. He didn't look like he was hitting against some guy that was six foot six and throwing 102 miles an hour. So I, I think we see it in every sport, and I think you got to coach that on a daily basis, and. I think when we're going back to what we originally started about our culture, our culture is kind of breeding poise. Steve used to say about John Merrick, you know, John Merrick's really, really special player, you know, and when he was really, really young, like he got this probably quicker than anybody. And 
you'd watch him park and walk into the club and he looked the same way every day. He was just full of that poise. So when you're sitting there watching golf next time, if you took a picture of that, look on your phone and you'll see that. What is surf? <laughs> I'll let you go first. That's me, not you. Notice the wave's bigger, mine, than yours. Where, where's mine? Now you want to talk about you, huh? Okay, <laughs> go ahead. Anyways, um, uh, Jamie and I, have that, that we have that in, in common where we do uh, love, love to surf. Uh, it's, again, great for mind and body. Uh, we actually, from that, I have been a, have a very successful uh, summer that golf a, camp. That is a pretty big wave. No, that's in Hawaii. That's, that's bigger than yours. That's bigger than yours. Hawaii. What? <laughs> that's a big wave. <laughs> so what we do with surf um, is we break it down as, as our as our keys to success. This is our mantra where all our coaches and our students, when they come in for um, their interviews, that they're all going to learn how to surf. Uh, which basically is uh, simplicity and si simple and safe, basi basically uh, understanding. So this, so our our students understand what we're talking about, and we also, uh, more importantly, understand what they want. Retention, you know, how we get them to retain the information we're giving. But again, most important, most importantly, is to retain them as golfers for for life. And then probably the most important thing is fun. Uh, if you're not having fun doing it, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't even matter. So uh, that's, that's how we live our, our lives in, in our culture at all of our schools there. Cool. I'm, I'm going to go a different direction. I like the way he broke it into that because he's a, if you're a surfer, you're a surfer. Like there's just something about it. Same like, like we're golfers, you know. I eulogized this guy that was a golfer, and you know, I stood up and said, this guy was a golfer, and everybody started crying uh, you know, five years ago or something when he died, unfortunately, one of the guys that taught me to play. So you know what being a golfer like. For me, it's like being a surfer, but my angle is totally different on surfing. <clears throat> I don't know what my handicap is about surfing. There's no bogeys. I know that in our job, like, I don't sleep very well. Um, I'm got trying to run two big operations, a bunch of tour players and a club with, you know, a lot of people that want a lot of stuff and there's insurances and taxes and all this stuff going on. But it's the one time that I don't think about anything. And I'll tell you, when I get out of the water is when I start thinking about something again. So like, it's a common morning, like V, when she's in town training, I'll take her to the beach, she'll run on the beach a little bit, you know, and she'll tell you like, I jump in the water and I'll go, you know, get waves, and I might get 30 waves, 20 waves, whatever. Some of them really good, some of them not so good. Every wave I feel a little bit younger, and I don't think about what I'm doing. And I have to think all day long, and I have, like I said, you know, I have this linear mind that has to become a surfer after that. So it's the one time. So my encouragement for you is find a surf if you don't have one. Whatever you want it to be, it doesn't have to be surfing. Uh, Andy, you can do the wheel. I don't want you to start surfing, okay? Um, and, and, Sarge, you can probably do it. You're fit enough now, okay? Um, anyways, I would suggest that you got that feeling. And it's really crazy. Like, I feel my eyes, and I feel my, my skin, and I feel more fit, and I feel, you know, it's the ocean. When I get out of the water, I'm like, oh, my God, I got to surf today. But it's really weird in watching... Our players come off after a really good round. They kind of have that same look in their eyes, you know. Patrick made a really big putt three years ago in Chicago to qualify for the Tour Championship. He was the guy that qualified for the Tour Championship in the least amount of events. I think only Rory and Tiger had knew it less. He only played like 11 or 12 events. And he made like a 10, 12-footer on 18 um, and just gutted it, poured it in there. And he came walking out, and I was standing by the scorer's tent and uh, just waiting for him, and, uh, which is common what we'll do. And he just cruised by, and I watched him. He's not signing very many autographs. Patrick, he needs to get better at that. But um, he's just walking past, and then all of a sudden he looks up at me, and he goes, you know, I go, how was it? And he goes, cool. All right. And his eyes were looked like that. They felt like I did when I surfed. And then he walked in the scoring tent, and he came back out, and he knew I knew whether he was going to make it or not. And he goes, 
is that going to be good enough? And I said, well, I don't think we really can change it now. But you played lovely, and the putt on the last hole was lovely. And he goes, cool. And he goes, well, why don't you stay out here and figure out what's going on, because we've got to figure out what we're going to travel next week or what we're going to do. And I'm going to go in and take a shower and change. So he went in the locker room, and then Peter Jacobson called me a minute ago and go, hey, he made it, or a minute later, and said he made it, you know. So then when Patrick got done, I said, you know, hey, uh, you're in the Tour Championship next week. And he went, cool. And he had that same look, you know, in his eyes, relaxed, comfortable that I feel with my surf. So surf super important, and you've got to find your surf if you don't have it. What is the most important thing you have learned in the five decades, five decades, that's been really that you have played, coach this game. Wait a minute, there? who said five? Is that Andy's or mine? I don't know, five decades, that means. Five decades. Yeah, what well, was the most important 80s, thing? 80s, 90s, start of 2000. Yeah, that's five decades. Oh my God, I'm old. I gotta keep surfing. Um, oh, that's hard. If you don't 100% know what you're saying, don't say it. If you don't 100% know what you're saying, don't say it. Even if it's just a little chipping lesson with a junior and you're trying to figure out how they think or they learn, if you're not 100% comfortable with the direction you're doing, don't say it. How many people have broke that rule? Josh, first up with your hand, okay? And if you haven't broke that rule, I don't think you're taking a good enough look at what you're doing. And I would say every year that we've got to do that, we've got better at that. And it gives you more integrity in everything that you do, but definitely as a coach and definitely as a teacher. And it makes you, if you don't have the answer, you have to go try to find the answer. And you have to search in some pretty distant places for that. And that's why the wheel really hurt, helps with that. But I'd like to see that be done a lot more. Um, you, you know, Phil said something last year when we were here. How many were here didn't saw Phil last year, you know? And, he said, I'm just throwing stuff on the wall to see that it sticks. It'd be pretty interesting with Phil, like if you didn't let him throw the stuff on the wall, right? Like he's already unbelievable, he can do everything. So, but you, I think that's like the doctor going in and not knowing what the diagnosis is and writing a prescription for you or having surgery or doing something crazy like that. And you are, we are professionals. It says it right next to our name. It says it on all the emblems out here. So if you want to be a professional, you got to 100% know what you're saying. And I don't know is a perfectly sufficient answer. It's Patrick Cantlay's favorite answer. It's Luke List's favorite answer. Luke's like, he calls me brother or pro. He's like, hey, brother, what do you think about this? And I'm like, I don't know. And he goes, all right. Uh, and he also says, I appreciate you saying that because he knows that I'm not making it up. Um, and I... I, I I don't know how great that we are at that, but I know that's been really helpful for me, and I'm not trying to preach that my way is the best way because there's a bunch of great teachers in this room and a bunch of great teachers in the, in the world, but I know that's been an effective tool for us. That's awesome. I think I did manage this time perfectly. For, we have a couple more minutes for uh, any, any questions for Jamie. Yeah, we got about five minutes for questions, so knock them out. What you got? Why, why don't we, uh, Caesar? why don't we mic pass at that time, okay, if you can? Or Steve, could you help with that? You have a mic? Perfect. And if you don't get a mic, go ahead and speak loud, okay? Thanks a lot. Uh, going back to neutrality, I love neutrality too in the setup there. When you show that picture of V in the setup when you're on, the, on your pro's angle there, uh, your center of gravity neutral and set up. What's your philosophy on center of gravity and set up? This is my philosophy on center of gravity. Everybody sit like this with their head as much as they can and move it to the right. And you should feel the weight go into your right butt and down into your foot if you're standing up. You should feel it in your butt if you're sitting down. Then move back to the middle and you should feel it neutralized. And then move it over to the left and you should feel it move like that. And you move back to the middle and there it goes. And I see it in my mind as like a little tube that's got fluid in it. And I think that's been described to me by a lot of people. Kevin, you like that? Like a little fluid in there and that's the balance and it kind of goes like this and that and you're trying to find a middle point. I think he'll probably talk about that a little bit, but that'll be that. Good question. I don't know. I just, the hole's like, what is the hole, you know? 
What's the proper dimensions again? Nobody talks about. Go ahead. You, what's the proper dimensions? No, of the hole. What is it? Okay, cool. So for me, it just was four and five. And it's funny, like Brett will tell you, you like Brett made this eagle putt in the Long Beach Open that we read it off a little ball mark. It was like a 40 putt. And I said, that's a 5-2. It's a 6-3. And then it goes back to a 3-8. So the putt zigzagged like that and went right in the middle of the hole. And the guy went, I hate those numbers, you know? So, but the numbers are really helpful. So that's that. The four and five was just, it was an easy way to distinguish it. And we're reading off of that or that. Hi. Okay, okay, according to your wheel, what do you do with players who, they're young, their parents bring them out. I'm getting a lot of kids who are exhausted, so tired during the lesson. I said, what time did you go to sleep? What did you eat for breakfast? Because they are zombies. 12.30, a 10-year-old said, I went to bed at 12.30 last night, I was on YouTube. And I look at the parents, like, I can't you're work walking, with them. You're, walk, you're walking delicate ground there to tell yeah. somebody how to raise their child. Especially well, for me, because I don't have any children, although I kind of do. Yeah. Um, so you're I walking, don't tell the parents, I just look at them and I go. Well, you're walking delicate ground there, but at the end of the day, you know, it sounds like you have a rest issue. And so if the player's going to continue to get better, they need rest. And I will tell you, every one of our tour players on Friday afternoon, when their rounds are over, there's something about rest in my text. So rest and fresh are a big one, you know. Kevin and I are working really hard on Patrick with rest and fresh because he's so diligent. What you got? Can you coach your players? to uh, learn how to get the poise, or does it come from that, that de inside? That, de that definition is going to be really helpful, because what that does, it breaks it down to why aren't they poised, you know? I got players that are scared, you know? They're just scared. So, like, for scared, it's like, what are you scared of? You know, it's not the NFL where you're going to run back a kickoff and somebody's going to break your back, you know? It's just a putt, or it's just a shot, and what are you really scared of? Scared of what people think of me because, you know, uh, I didn't play good. Does that really matter? At the end of the day, we all get here by ourselves and we all die alone and people, you know, at the end of the day, it just goes. So kind of breaking it down to a simplest little thing of like what's going to make them, what's going to figure that out. Tough is the big thing in this. I love tough. Like there's still, there's still some scrapers out there on the PGA. Ryan Armour comes to mind right away. Like he's toughed it out on the PGA Tour for 20 years just with toughness. So, and I've had some show-stopping Ferraris that swing like Jesus, and I, I imagine that Jesus swung good, and um, with the sandals and the flowing robe. But anyways, they swang perfect, but they didn't have any toughness, and therefore they didn't play very good. So, Jamie, we got one here in the back. Good question. Yep, fire. Jamie, uh, thanks for being here. This is really great. Um, thanks the wheel as far as like helping a student create their own wheel. Do you have any advice in that regard? And does what, what was the helping, helping a student create their own wheel? Yeah, I think you, I think what you're really noticing is we know our students really well because we've taken a look at the macro picture. And like I said, the thread through this needle all kind of fits together, I think. So I think what you got to do is just is knowing your player and then kind of figure out what they're doing and then and we said this already, then you gotta watch them play golf, and then you gotta watch them compete when it matters. And you, when you're, you're used to watching golf and you watch them play, you're gonna know. And if you can't get close enough to them, then caddy for them, and then you really figure out, you know? You're standing out there, they got 120 yards and no win, and they're going, what club should I hit, you know? One, on one more Tour. question. Yeah. You have a voice. Hi, Roger. Shoot. Yeah, I'm probably going to go back to what worked before. I mean, at the end of the day, when we kind of revamped John Cook, we went back to what Mr. Venturi taught him and stayed with those keys rather than, you know, he was hanging around Isleworth and he was getting a lot of different things about this, 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 and this. And, we went back to those keys, so I would say that would be mechanical, but five putts in a row at a professional level when you're missing, there's normally more to that, so I want to hear about the story. And like I said, our most important tool is the iPhone, and so those texts really tell me a lot. Like it took, I've coached Veronica for 15, 18 years, something like that. It took 
till within the last couple years where she could tell me about a round, like what happened. And not only that, on Monday, she could tell me what she was doing on Monday in order to be really comfortable. So when Thursday started, she was cool. And she's been an unbelievable student as far as doing that and, 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 and relaying that. So I think that's a big thing. Roger, just missing four cuts in a row at the level that you play golf in, it's probably not your right elbow at the top of the backswing. And if it is, that's the easiest thing, you know. Patrick said a really interesting thing in our Golf Digest spread. The guy said, you know, can you tell me about your swing? And he said, no, Jamie worries about my swing. Uh, let me rephrase that. He said, Jamie takes care of my swing. So he's not worrying about his swing, and he already knows what he's doing in his swing, and I know what he's doing in his swing. And we kind of showed you today, like, if you want to just take it to the basics, you got some really good basics there as well. That's, that's it? Can I that's say it. one thing to him? Okay, yeah. one more thing. Yeah. Um, last thing to leave you with. <clears throat> I, I, leave, I, I normally do this at the end every time. If you like what we do for a living, you got a chance to be pretty good at it. If you love what we do for a living, you got a chance to be real good at it. If, and there's a difference between love and in love. If you're in love with it, you got a chance to be great with it. If you're not in love with it, you're probably, especially going to the highest level, you're doing a disservice to your uh, students. So we all have to be at work every day. Why don't we all try to be in love with this? And if you're not doing this, why don't you figure out what to do? And stuff like this is a really good start. Remember, today's opinions were just my opinions, but they're really based on a we culture. I want to thank my staff and my players for being so unbelievable. They teach me more than I've ever taught them. Thanks, Jamie. Before I give the mic back to Shar, uh, I want to do one thing. Is everybody has their phone? I want everybody to bring their phone out. Please humor me. I know everyone's got a phone. Number one, make sure it's, it's, it's off. It never seems to feel all these things that I go through. It's always that one. Oh, I thought I had it off, and, and the phone goes off. So turn that off. Then go to your calendar. March 23rd of next year is going to be the... Uh, 2020 Youth Summit uh, that's going to be held at the Tiger, Tiger Woods uh, Learning Lab, March 23rd. Is Josh Alpert here? Stand up, Josh. So jo Josh is on the teaching committee, and he's putting together a, a unbelievable program. Again, I saw a lot of hands uh, raised at you teaching juniors. Uh, this is going to be a big event as we've blown this event, the, the fall uh, event up. We're going to blow the Youth Summit event. How many of you are PGA.coach certified? Raise your hands, please. Raise your hands. All right, turn. This is another thing that we want to get everyone to do is go, go through that certification as it deals with a lot that we're going to be talking about uh, th through the uh, two days here. So get, so get that done. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, gents. That was fantastic. Um, Jamie, Veronica and I were talking. We don't know how you remember every shot that you've ever seen on the golf course, but literally you could probably, I mean, the third hole at you name the tournament and you've got it in your mind exactly what went on and probably what the player was thinking when they hit it, um, which is really, really cool um, and a testament to how much golf you've watched and that you're, uh, you're living and doing what you're talking about. Um, Every, each and every day. It's very cool. I got to watch it firsthand for a number of years, um, and uh, everything you said is exactly what goes on. Uh, it really, uh, I remember, because I've always loved the mechanics of the golf swing. I think uh, that's probably a, a lot of us in the room. And I got there the first uh, week I was working at Virginia Country Club, and he had a bunch of the guys out there. Craig was out there, uh, Mallinger, Merrick, they're hitting balls together, and I expected that all their swings were going to look really similar. And I thought, you know what, there's a, there's a you know, kind of a perfect that we have in our mind of how we like to see the golf club. And I saw the three guys, and they looked totally different. And then I saw Paul Goidos, and I was like, okay, <laughs> this is really, really different. Steve will tell you, um, one day he went out there, and um, he heard Paul was out practicing. He hadn't seen him before, and the guys in the shop said, yeah, he's up on the upper driving range. Go ahead, you can go up there and check him out. And he went up there, he wasn't sure which player he was. <laughs> so, uh, in any event. Um, 30 million dollars later, right? Yeah, yeah I, it works and it repeats. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, we want to ask Mr. Latendre to come back up for a moment. They have a little 
a uh, little something they'd like to share with you oh, before not, you leave the stage. You're not supposed to do this. Thank you, Shar. Well, well Jamie, you, you know, <laughs> one of the nice things about being the president is you kind of get to call audible once in a while. All right. And I know you're going to kill yeah, me I for this. Our, I noticed our president calling an audible. <laughs> <laughs> so I know you're going to kill me for this, but, uh, I, I am. you know, normally we would do this at the annual meeting. And, uh, you know, it's my distinct honor that uh, we get to select somebody for a president's award every year. And uh, this cool. gentleman up here on the stage has done so much for our section behind the scenes, uh, so much that you just really don't know about. I will tell you that when I was sworn in as the president, uh, he was the first person to reach out to me and extend his hand and say, I will help in any way that I can, just I don't want to sit on the board. It's just not his style. So his way of helping in not any that way board. that, no, not that board, but any, his, way, board. his way of yeah. helping out any way that he can, uh, he is uh, one of the founding members and, and very integral in the creation of this California Teaching and Coaching Summit. Uh, we owe him a debt of gratitude for that. Uh, we owe him a debt of gratitude for everything that he's done to make us better. Uh, and he continues to do that in every way, shape, or form. He uses his connections to benefit our foundation. He uses his connections to benefit us as PGA members. So the 2019, it's my honor to present you with the President's Award for 2019. I thought it'd be better to do it here than at the annual meeting. Congratulations. All right, thank you. That's cool. Put tears in my eyes. So, thank you, guys. Whoa, 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 hold on, hold on. Well, do you want to say something, or should I just apologize you to you for you, embarrassing you? Put tears you. in my eyes. I'm, I did a eulogy again Saturday. I'm still a little misty from that. So, thanks, you guys. It's a uh, this is a labor Thank you loss. very thank much, you. Jamie. Thanks. I know you have something to do with that. Thanks. <laughs>